turn to Revelation 2, we are coming to the second letter that Jesus writes to these seven specific churches in the book of Revelation. Uh, we saw in chapter 1, verse 19, the outline for the entire book. Uh, Jesus tells John, write the things which you have seen, past tense, that was chapter 1 when he saw the vision of the glorified Jesus, write the things which are, and he tells us the things which are, are the seven churches, chapters 2 and 3, and then he says, write the things which take place after this, chapter 4, verse 1 says, after this, or the Greek word is metatauta, after these things, and then everything from chapter 4 to the end, it's all in the future. So we're looking at the things which are, which are the things of the seven churches that represent the entire church age from the first century till today, till the rapture. We know that these seven churches were actual churches in present-day Turkey. Uh, these churches also represent specific time periods throughout church history, like the first one, Ephesus, and even their names mean something very significant. That's why Jesus chose these seven churches. The first one, Ephesus, their name means desired ones. And we saw that they were a great church. They're on fire for the Lord, for his word. They're doing all these great works. They see false teachings. They, they spot it out. They call it out. And then Jesus says, there's one thing I have against you. You left your first love the desired ones. He desired their love. And so he says, unless you repent and you know, remember where you fall and repent and do the first works, then I'm taking your lampstand out, which means I'm removing my presence from you because love is the most important thing. They can have all the doctrine down right, but if they don't have love working in them and through them, then that church is meaningless to the Lord. They're just going through the motions. They're playing churchianity, you might say, instead of living out their Christian lives. So as we come into the second church, Jesus has no sharp words of rebuke for them because, as we'll see, this is a church that is in the, the midst of heavy-duty persecution. Uh, they find themselves going through trials and struggles that most of us cannot, cannot relate to. I mean, they are going through very, very difficult times. So all they could do was hold fast to Jesus, trust in him alone, because everything else in the world around them was just coming against them. But we'll, as we'll also see, this church that was going through so much hardship, they represent the next phase of Christianity. Um, from 64 AD to 313 AD, there were 10 waves of persecution from 10 different Roman emperors, starting with uh, Caesar Nero all the way to Diocletian. And these 10 Roman emperors brought heavy-duty persecution against the church. For 250 years, 6 million Christians were martyred for their faith. If that was in today's terms, population-wise, 6 million Christians put to death then would be like the equivalent of all Americans put to death, 330 million. I mean, that's how bad it was at that time. They went through heavy-duty things. This is a letter that's for everybody, though. Every persecution, uh, every situation, every country where we see these things. The only thing they were guilty of here in Smyrna was they refused to bow their knee to Caesar. They refused to say, Caesar is Lord. All they had to do was say, Caesar is Lord, and then everything would be fine. But because they refused to say, Caesar is Lord, they were put to death. C.S. Lewis, great quote. Years ago, C.S. Lewis once said, God whispers to us in our pleasures. He speaks to us in our conscience. But God shouts to us in our pain. Suffering is God's megaphone to arouse a deaf world. End quote. As you've probably already noticed, this letter is only four verses long. It's kind of like a little postcard from Jesus. But what I've found over the years is when somebody's going through a really hard time, their really desperate time in their life, they don't need a lot of words. They don't need a lot of Bible study. They just need somebody to sit there with them and show love, compassion, give them hope and encouragement. And sometimes just sitting with a person in pain speaks volumes to them. And as many of you know, especially you with little kids or grandkids, you know that some of the greatest lessons we learn is through pain. Don't touch that stove. It's hot. Yeah, now you learn a good lesson because it was painful. We've all been there. We've all experienced that. But how we handle those difficult times will either cause either one of two things to happen in our lives. 
How you handle pain and suffering and, and hardship, it causes you to become either a better person because you're trusting in the Lord through it, you're relying on him, you're, you're holding fast to Jesus and his promises, or you'll become a bitter person. You'll be mad, you'll be upset, you'll be complaining and grumbling, you, you'll be looking for an easy way out, and you become resentful and angry and bitter. So you might say pain and suffering is inevitable because we all go through it, but misery and bitterness is optional, right? You have the option. You want to be a better person through it or you want to be a bitter person. So for being only four verses long, what Jesus says to this hurting church will hopefully speak loud and clear to all of us, especially when we're going through our own times of hardship and difficulties a little bit about Smyrna. Smyrna is a church that was located 35 miles north of Ephesus. So from your angle on the Aegean Sea, present-day Turkey, you have Ephesus. You go 35 miles north, it's Smyrna. And then as you come back down around the interior of Turkey, you have Pergamos, Thyatira, uh, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. So it's like a little bit of a semicircle around that area of present-day Turkey. Like Ephesus, Smyrna was a seaport town, but not nearly as big. Ephesus was huge, very wicked and corrupt. Smyrna was small, beautiful, very wicked and corrupt. Their nickname for Smyrna was the uh, Crown of Asia. Because when you were on a ship coming into port there in Smyrna, there's a hill right behind it, and they had these four massive um, temples. One was to Zeus, one was Symbile, Symbile, the female goddess. One was to uh, Apollo, that was the biggest one. And then they had another temple to Caesar, they built for Caesar Tiberius. So from coming in on the ocean, you see these big temples on this hillside. So it looked like a crown, so it was called the Crown of Asia. They also had a very large Jewish population there in Smyrna with a lot of synagogues scattered about. And it was this combination of pagan worship, emperor worship, and uh, the hatred that they would experience from the Jewish people made it very difficult for Christians at this time. Um, we're not sure exactly how Smyrna got started. We believe it started with a, uh, Paul being in Ephesus. He was there for three years in Ephesus. He taught the word of God for two years in Ephesus, and then it tells us this, Acts chapter 19, verse 10 says, and this continued for two years, so that all who dwelt in Asia, that means Asia Minor, present-day Turkey, all who were in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. And so probably somebody from Paul's ministry traveled 35 miles north and started the church of Smyrna, um, at this time, when Jesus is writing these letters, the book of Revelation is written around 96 AD. This is when John the Apostle was uh, sent to the island of Patmos as a political prisoner. And the, the bishop or the pastor of this church in Smyrna, possibly at this time, was a man named Polycarp. We know Polycarp was the pastor there for many, many years, and he was very, very young at this time uh, when he became pastor of this church. So this letter might have been written to this amazing man, very famous in uh, the Christian history. And um, we'll look at him in more, uh, more here in a moment. But uh, again, the names are significant. Ephesus, desired ones. God desired their love. Smyrna means bitterness. But they get their name from their famous export, which was myrrh. Smyrna, their name comes from myrrh. That was their number one export, a very costly ointment. It was a bitter spice, but it put off a very sweet aroma. It's one of the three gifts they brought to the child Jesus when the wise men show up. Gold representing you know, his royalty. Frankincense symbolizing his deity that we can worship him. And then myrrh. It's kind of a weird gift to bring to a baby shower. Here's some myrrh. What's that for? Well, that's for burial. That's probably not on anybody's you know, list when they're doing a baby shower. Yeah, I'd like some, a bottle of myrrh for my kid for when they die. I mean, you just don't do that. It's just weird. So they bring myrrh, but it pointed to Jesus' death. 
here's why Jesus wrote this letter to these persecuted believers in Smyrna. Myrrh, myrrh was produced. It's like a resin-like substance, sticky substance that you get from this plant when you crush it and grind it up. And when it's crushed and ground up, it would produce this resin-like ointment that was known as myrrh, put off a beautiful aroma. That's what we're going to see with this church. Like this church, the, the myrrh, myrrh, like this church, they are going to be ground up and crushed for their faith in Jesus. Again, that's why he picked this church. And in the line, you got the first century church of Ephesus. The next 250 years, you've got the church of Smyrna, which is the persecuted church. And only when it was ground up, were they going to produce this beautiful aroma? Look at these verses. This is for you and I in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, starting in verse 14. How's your body odor today? I'm being facetious. You're like, oh, I think I smell pretty good. I took a shower yesterday. Well, good for you. Verse 14, now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one we are the aroma of death leading to death and to the other the aroma of life leading to life. And who is sufficient for these things. And so we're putting off an aroma to those when we preach the gospel. Oh man, life, it smells so good. Oh, you stink. I don't want to hear this. I don't want to hear about Jesus dying on the cross for me. So with that lengthy introduction, look at verse 8, chapter 2 of Revelation. To the angel of the church in Smyrna write, these things says the first and the last who is dead and came to life. A couple of things to note, as we saw last time, he says the same thing to each church, to the angel of. The Greek word is angelos, sometimes translated angel, sometimes translated messenger. That's a literal translation is messenger. John the Baptist is called the angelos of Jesus Christ, a forerunner. He was the messenger for Jesus, and it's used in Mark chapter 1, verse 2. He's the angelos, so don't think of it as an angel with wings. By the way, angels don't need messages from Jesus. They don't, you know, need a postcard from Jesus. You know, Michael the Archangel stands in the presence of the Lord. You know, they, they don't get send out letters. Hey, you know what God's doing now? No, the angels don't do that. He's going to call some of these angeloses and these churches to repent. Angels don't repent. It's one and done for an angel. When we get to chapter 12, we'll see Satan, Lucifer takes a third of the angels with him in his rebellion. They couldn't repent. They didn't have a chance to repent. It was one and done. They're gone forever, kicked out of the kingdom of God. So this is written to probably, my, my thought is to uh, the, the pastor here, Polycarp. Um, Polycarp was born in 69 AD. He was martyred at 155 AD. So he's about 27 years old when he receives this letter. John is about 96 years old as he's recording these things. But receiving this letter would just have been a, an amazing thing for this church. Jesus knows what we're going through. We're, we're getting persecuted big time. We're going through horrendous trials. So he says, these things says the first and the last, still in verse 8, who was dead and came to life. That's a description from chapter 1. And in every one of these letters, Jesus uses a description of his glorified nature, speaking to these seven churches. And this one he said earlier, the first and the last who was dead came to life. This is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. This is Jesus Christ. This is speaking of his deity. He is God. He's the creator, the originator of all things. Alpha, Omega, that means he's the consummator of all things. He's going to bring all things to an end. And we see that when we get to chapters 19 and 20 and 21. He's bringing it all to an end. This also means he knows everything about everything in between. So he knows everything about you, which is good. Or it can be, uh-oh, he knows everything about me. Not so good. 
So we, we just need to be open and honest with God. He knows everything about us. Now, when it says, when he says, who was dead and came to life, it literally means that he was the one who um, became dead. In other words, he didn't just die. He became dead. He allowed these sinful, wicked human beings, the Romans and the Jews, to beat him up, pierce him, nails in his hands, put him on the cross, spear up into his heart. He allowed that. He became dead. He was dead on the cross, but he became alive. He came to life, eternal life. He did that. Now, it was no mistake. He did that because he loves us. He did that because that was the whole plan and purpose for him leaving heaven, coming to earth, was to go to the cross, lay down his life, die in our place, taking upon himself all the wrath, the judgment we deserve for our sins. He took it upon himself because he loves us that much. So his victory over death has become their victory, as we'll see here with the church of Smyrna. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 15 says it like this, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, speaking of you and me, we became, you know, a little baby born in a manger. No, he was born in a manger. He himself likewise shared in the same. Jesus became flesh that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. And so freedom from death. What an encouragement to these believers in Smyrna. What an encouragement to all of those believers throughout the world who are being persecuted for their faith. What an encouragement to us. He was dead, but he's alive, and he has given us victory over death because he is alive. We will live forever with him. So what about this guy, Polycarp? i got to read this. Um, it's from the Apostolic Fathers. These are letters written. Some are by Ignatius, very godly man. He was a disciple of John the Apostle. Polycarp, he's in here because he was also a disciple of John the Apostle. And Polycarp, had a, he wrote some letters, but then he also had a letter written about his martyrdom from his congregation in Smyrna. They watched him get beaten and tortured and everything else they did to him. And so let me read a few things about the life of Polycarp. Godly man, he was 86 years old, and he was um, told... They're coming after you. The Romans are going to come after you. They're on horses. They want to arrest you. They want to kill you. They want to feed you to the lions. And so you need to hide. He goes, nah, I'm done. I'm not going to run. You know, let them do what they're going to do. And so it says, while he was praying, he fell into a trance for three days before his arrest. And he saw his pillow being consumed by fire. And this is the letter that his church wrote about his martyrdom. And he turned and said to those who were with him, it is necessary that I be burned alive. So it says he prayed that night and these horsemen were sent out with the Roman soldiers. They're armed with their weapons and they came to him. They found him in bed in an upstairs room in a small cottage. And though he could have escaped, he refused saying, may God's will be done. And then the police captain and his father came out to meet him. And after transferring him to their carriage and sitting down at his side, they tried to persuade him, saying, Why? What harm is there in saying Caesar is Lord and offering incense? You know, one of the things they would say, if you had a job, you worked for a guild or a union, you'd have to sprinkle a little incense on this little burning incense pot in front of your workplace, and you'd sprinkle it in and say, Caesar is Lord. I mean, it happens in India. We see this with Hindus. They still do the same thing. Whatever their God is, they can honor that God. So they're saying, just offer this incense. Say, Caesar is Lord. Save yourself. He gave no answer to them, but they persisted. And he said, I am not about to do what you are suggesting of me to do. And then they bring him to this stadium. And when people hear it's Polycarp, he was a famous pastor, all the stadium fills up with people because they're all excited about seeing another Christian killed. It says, as Polycarp entered the stadium, there came a voice from heaven, Be strong, Polycarp, and act like a man. No one saw the speaker, but those of our people who were present heard the voice. And then as he was brought forward, there was a great tumult when they heard that Polycarp had been arrested. Therefore, when he was brought before them, 
the proconsul asked if he were Polycarp. When he confessed that he was, the proconsul tried to persuade him to recant. Have respect for your age. Again, he's 86 years old. Swear by the genius of Caesar. Repent and say, away with the atheists. In other words, he's trying to get Polycarp to say, away with the atheists. Like the Christians were the atheists because they didn't worship Caesar and the rest of the pagan gods. Kind of like our modern day society today, calling evil good and good evil. Calling black white and white black. I mean, it's like, really? You're calling Christians the atheists? Oh, well. Anyway, he stops and he said, they said, swear the oath and I will release you. Revile Christ. Polycarp replied, for 86 years I have been his servant and he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? But as he continued to insist, saying, swear by the genius of Caesar, he answered, if you vainly suppose that I will swear by the genius of Caesar as you request and pretend not to know who I am, listen carefully. I am a Christian. Now, if you want to learn the doctrine of Christianity, name a day and give me a hearing. Proconsul said, persuade the people. But Polycarp said, you may have been considered worthy of a reply, but not them. So the proconsul said, I have wild beasts. I will throw them to you or throw you to them unless you change your mind. But he said, call for them. For the repentance from better to worse is a change impossible for us. But is a, it is a noble thing to change from that which is evil to righteousness. Then he said to him again, I will have you consumed by fire since you despise the wild beasts unless you change your mind. But Polycarp said, You threaten with a fire that burns only briefly, and after just a little while is extinguished. For you are ignorant of the fire of the coming judgment and eternal punishment, which is reserved for the ungodly. Talk about a burn. Wow. But why do you delay? Come, do what you wish. And so it goes on. But the bottom line is they light the fire under him. They wanted to nail him and tie him up to the stake. And he says, you don't need to do that. I'll stay here. I'm not going anywhere. And so they said, okay. So they light the fire around him. And it goes on to say that they witnessed this big arc of fire go up and over him like a sail. And it just whipped over him, didn't even do anything to him. And so he just stood there. And then one of the soldiers took his spear, thrust it through his heart, and he died. That's how he died. But as he thrust him through, so much blood came out, it extinguished the fire. And so that goes on in, in, in this letter that they write. They take him, they then burn his body, they collect up his bones, and they haul him away. He did that simply because he loved Jesus with all of his heart. This world was not worth anything to sell out for Jesus. Look at verse 9. Jesus says, I know your works, tribulation, poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Again, this is Jesus writing this letter to them. He gives no rebuke to this church or the church of Philadelphia. Every other church he rebukes sharply for something that they're doing wrong. But Jesus is letting them know he knows exactly what they're going through. Jesus went exactly through the same thing, beaten and tortured and crucified for our sins. But just to have that reassurance from Jesus that he's watching over them must have really boosted their spirits because, once again, they were going through tremendous persecution. When he says, I know your tribulation, the Greek word for tribulation is thalipsis, which is used to run something over grain when you're trying to separate the wheat from the chaff. If you look at a, a um, when we go to, Capernaum there on the Sea of Galilee, we see these big um, um, millstones. I mean, they weigh 1,000 pounds to 2,000 pounds. These giant rock millstones are about this wide. You know, many of them are like this big around. There's a hole in it. And they'd go around in the millstone where they would put grapes to either, you know, crush the grapes, get the juice out, or they put olives in there. They, you know, crush it to get the olive oil out. So this is what they were going through. It's the thalipsis. It's constant pressure. Jesus is letting them know, you're going to be going through this till you are ground to a pulp. A side note, after the Romans put Polycarp to death 
In 155 AD, they shortly thereafter rounded up 1,500 more Christians because with his death, many became bold in their faith. So they get 1,500 more Christians in Smyrna and they put them to death in one day. Short time later, they gather up 800 more Christians and in one day they put all them to death. I mean, that was how brutal this time frame was. Psalm 116, look at this verse, verse 15. This is a promise to all the persecuted believers. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. You know, they were releasing that sweet aroma of eternal life as they were being ground down for their faith. Now, these things are important to remember whenever we go through whatever trial, whatever heartache it might be. There could be an unexpected death in the family. There can be an unexpected diagnosis from the doctor. There can be uh, an unexpected breakup in a marriage. You get laid off of work. I mean, there can be so many things that, you know, all of a sudden it happens. And I can guarantee that the enemy is going to go around when you're going through a hard time, and he's going to say things like, where's God now? Now that you're going through this, where, where's God now? Maybe he's too busy for somebody like you. Maybe he's got more important people to think about than you. Maybe he just forgot all about you because he's running the rest of the world. I mean, Satan can throw all kinds of stuff out there, but don't listen to his lies because the promise of God's word is true. You know, we saw it in, you know, in Hebrews 13, 5, we have the promise, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you, says the Lord. The last verse we saw a few weeks ago in Matthew, Jesus says, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So he's not going to bail out on you, even in your most difficult days. Look also in verse 9 here, Jesus says to them, I know your poverty. The word poverty here means to be financially destitute. Some say it literally means to, have, to not have two pennies to rub together. That was the state of the church here in Smyrna. They were the poorest of the poor in their city, a city that was very wealthy. Now, they didn't start off poor as Christians. They became very, very poor because the stronger the church got, the more the Romans resented them, the more the Jews resented them. When a Jew got saved, and he came from Judaism, got saved, then his family would disown him. If the Roman, you know, People, they realize, oh, there's a Christian. We're not going to support his business anymore. And so they became very, very destitute. Very difficult time. They could have ended it by just saying Caesar is Lord, but they would not do so. No real Christian is going to bow their knee or their heart to Caesar. This church, financially poor, how does Jesus look at this church? Does he see them as poor and miserable and naked and blind? No. What does he say here? I know your poverty, but I say you are rich. You might be poor in the world's eyes, but in Jesus' eyes, you are spiritual billionaires, spiritually speaking. Jesus, his evaluation of me and you that's really all that matters. Like this church of Smyrna, I want to be rich in faith. I want to be rich in grace. I want to be rich in love. I want to have an abundance of mercy and compassion. I want to gather up piles of forgiveness. But those are spiritual riches that money can't buy. Jesus said, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and yet lose his soul? Bill Gates, Elon Musk, you can fill in the blank. I mean, all these... Multi-multi-billionaires, they don't have time for God. You know, Bill Gates is quoted as saying, I don't have time to waste going to church because I could have made, you know, $60 million on that time I'd be in a church. That's a horrible way to look at life. Think about these things. I mean, Jesus washed our sins away with his own blood. What price tag would you put on that? Jesus has given you the free gift of everlasting life. Could you put a price tag on that? Absolutely not. This is why the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians 1 verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. I mean, every spiritual blessing. I cannot even fathom a fraction of the spiritual blessings I have in Christ. It's like the proverbial tip of the iceberg. You know, I, I appreciate, I love, I, I'm so thankful for all that the Lord has done, but it's so incomprehensible, the depths of his love, the depths of his grace and mercy and compassion. It's just incredible. Here's another great verse for those who are going through difficult times. Psalm 72, starting in verse 12. For he will deliver the needy when he cries, the poor also, and him who has no helper. He will spare the poor and needy, and will save the souls of the needy. He will redeem their life from oppression and violence. Sounds like Smyrna. And precious shall be their blood in his sight. Now, when I read these verses, you know, I think of our own, you know, brothers and sisters in Northeast India, you know, our church planters. You know, I've been there four times, and every time I go, I mean, it's just amazing to see these guys. They have nothing of the world. I mean, they live in bamboo huts, but they, they for what we give them, I mean, they travel village to village with nothing, usually just some food and water to get them to the next village. And they just sit there. They'll preach the gospel to those who come along. They share the word of God with them. Last year, we saw over 3,000 people come to Christ. You know, we got 50 church planners that we support, that you support. That's the first time we've had all 50 of them supported at once. I mean, it's awesome because God is using them. They're poor in the world's eyes. You bring them over here, they're thinking, man, you guys are all billionaires. That's how they would look at us. You go over there and you realize, man, they're the ones that are truly blessed. When I come there and they're like, oh, Pastor Jeff, we're so glad you're here. Oh, we just want to, you know, teach us the word of God because they don't have anything. They just love being taught the word of God. And they're so blessed by that. And I'm thinking, man, I'm 10 times more blessed just being around you guys than anything I give to you. I mean, because they've gone through so much. I mean, the last pastor's conference that we did with the, the former Muslims when we were there, while we were ending up the conference, we got a report, you know, I can't remember his name now, but his house was burned down during the conference just because he was a Christian. You know, he had to move, they had to rebuild. I mean, that happens all the time. We've had a couple of our church planners who were arrested about two years ago, and, and we paid the large sum of $180 to get them out of jail that they were in for, what, six months? It was a long time being mistreated horribly. For what? Talking to people about Jesus. That was the only crime they committed. Amazing. So compared to all of us, they're poor financially, but oh, how rich they are in the eyes of Jesus. So faithful to proclaim the word of God, the gospel of Christ, to so many lost and hurting, desperate people in their region. So Jesus says, you are rich. How does he measure spiritual success? By your bank account? No. He'll tell the church that is financially rich, the church of Laodicea, because his church is saying, it's like the Word of Faith church today. They say, I'm rich. I'm wealthy. I'm in need of nothing. You know what Jesus tells them? You can look it up. It's the church of Laodicea. He says, I say to you, you're poor. You're blind. You're miserable. You're naked. They had everything the world could offer, but they didn't have Jesus. They were walking contrary to the word of the Lord. Jesus never said that if you believe in me and just have more faith, you will be healthy and wealthy. You'll never get sick and you'll drive the nicest of chariots. Never said that. He never promised us perpetual physical health and material wealth while living in this world. We are blessed so much in this world as American Christians, but don't let that go to your head. Jesus says this, John 16, 33, These things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. There's a promise you don't see on many people's refrigerators. How about this one? You got this one on your fridge? 2 Timothy 3.12, the Apostle Paul says, Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Yes, sign me up. You don't see it. 
That's not where our mind goes. But for those in these foreign countries that are being mistreated, we, we see in Uganda, we see it in Sudan, we see in so many places, Christians being martyred for their faith. I mentioned, you know, 330 million Christians or Americans dying. That's the same as 6 million back in that time frame. The 20th century, from 1900 to 2000, that century saw more Christians martyred for their faith than all the previous 1900 years. I mean, it's not getting better. It's getting worse. The only reason we've had it so good in America, it's not because of our great and awesome faith, but it's because of our God's great and awesome grace. Don't ever forget that. Wise is the Christian who recognizes that God is the source of all of our blessings, both financially, but most of all spiritually. And Paul has some, you know, amazing things, wonderful things to say to all of us who are materially wealthy, as we are in this country. We got it better than 95% of the rest of the world. So yeah, we are totally blessed. We just finished up in our men's study last week, 1 Timothy chapter 6. And Paul says in 1 Timothy 6, verse 17, command those who are rich in this present age, nothing wrong with being rich, materially, financially, but this is what he says, command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty or puffed up, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Don't put your faith in your bank account. Keep your faith in Jesus. It's like I always say every, we're getting ready for election, midterms. Don't put your faith in who's in Washington, D.C. Keep your faith in Jesus. Those bozos on both sides are going to come and go. But Jesus will stand forever and ever. He is in control. So keep those things in mind. When we get to the seventh letter, Jesus will rebuke them sharply because they put their faith, their trust in their material wealth. Now, the last thing he says here in verse 9, says he knows the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews, but are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. That's heavy duty. What does that mean? How can a Jew not be a Jew? That's what he's saying here. It's similar to what Jesus said to the religious leaders in Israel when they accused him, Jesus, of doing all his miracles in the power of Beelzebub or the power of Satan. That's what the Jews were, you know, saying Jesus is doing these things by the power of Satan. Matthew 12, 31, Jesus says to them, Therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven men. Because the Holy Spirit was working in and through Jesus, just like he works in and through us. They were saying, no, it's Satan's Spirit. That's why he's doing these things. That's part of the synagogue of Satan. Jesus says this in John 8, 44, You... <laughs> This is not politically correct, by the way. Jesus says, you are of your devil, of the father of the devil. Don't do that when you witness to somebody. The desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. But because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Which of you convicts me of sin? If I tell you the truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God, hears, the, hears God's words. Therefore, you do not hear because you are not of God. And so those Jews who Jesus says are of the synagogue of Satan are those who reject him as Messiah, as Lord. They would be the, the same who came against God's people. And they were coming against Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. They were part of the synagogue of Satan. This is true of any group that opposes Jesus Christ. I would put Saul of Tarsus in that class of being of the synagogue of Satan. That's Paul the Apostle, by the way. Before he got saved, what did he do? He tells us what he did. He had Christians arrested. They were Jews that he thought were following a false prophet named Jesus. Paul had them arrested, dragged them back to Jerusalem. He had some put to death. He had some imprisoned. Obviously, he was in the synagogue of Satan before he got saved. You're either in one kingdom or the other, God's kingdom or the kingdom of darkness. Paul says it like this in Colossians 1.13. He, that's God, 
has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us, that means transferred us, in, into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. So Jesus sees all. He knows all. You can't fool Him. So look at verse 10. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Take note of what Jesus is telling this persecuted church. Don't fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. When I read this, I'm amazed because Jesus gives them no out. Take note of that. He doesn't say, I know what you're going through, but don't worry, I'm going to make it stop. Sometimes we wish he would, but he's like, no, I'm not going to make it stop. In fact, it's going to get worse. He emphatically tells them, don't fear, but stay faithful to me. You're going to suffer. You're going to be put to death. But keep your faith and trust in me, and I'll give you the crown of life. That crown of life, that's the greatest gift of all. Eternal life with Jesus for eternity. Why did he pick the name Smyrna that's known as the crown of Asia? Well, there's another reason why, because here's a crown of Asia. Look what the world can give you. I'm going to give you the crown of life, infinitely greater than anything you can get from this world. The crowns of this world will fade away, but the crown of life means you will be with Jesus forever and ever. A couple more verses. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 24, Paul says, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate, moderate in all things, now they do it, talking about the world and, you know, the athletes and everybody else, uh, they do it to obtain a perishable crown. I was going through my garage eh, a few months back, you know, we're cleaning it out and I got this box in there and I started looking at it. I got all these trophies in there from baseball, pitching, you know, throwing no hitters. I got all these uh, embarrassing trophies from being the best at the accordion. I had these trophies from being a great accordion player when I was from 6 to 12 years old. You think I'm proud of those? <laughs> I'm going to put these on the shelf. Oh, yeah. No, all the trophies and all the wreaths, all the you know gold medals, it's all going to rust and fade away at some point. So he says, they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown... And so these Christians in Smyrna, they had real faith. They had strong faith in Jesus. They could have stopped the persecution at any minute. They could have compromised and said, you know what? I'm tired of getting punished. I'm tired of getting persecuted. I'm tired of seeing my friends being thrown to lions or burned at the stake. Okay, here's your little incense. Caesar is Lord. What is that? That's denying Jesus. Real Christians would never do such a thing. This is what separates the wheat from the chaff. Matthew chapter 10, verse 32, Jesus says, Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Again, heavy-duty stuff to this little church that's being so severely persecuted. What's his last statement mean here in verse 10 where he says, you will be tested and have 10 days of tribulation. I'm not 100% sure. I think it refers to the 10 waves of persecution that they went under from the 10 different Neros, the emperors from Caesar to Diocletian from 64 AD to 312, and then Constantine takes over in 313, and then it ends. Some say it's just Jesus' way of saying he puts a limit on how much he allows us to go through. Uh, I don't know. 
but he gives them reassuring words. Verse 11, he who has an ear. All of you got at least one. So he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Again, his glorious promise to this church, if you're an overcomer, in other words, you put your faith and trust in Christ alone, you will not be hurt by the second death. For us, eternity with the Lord in glory. For the unsaved, eternity away from the Lord in the lake of fire. That's the second death. We'll look at this in detail when we get to it in Revelation 20, but look at these verses, starting in verse 13. This is after the millennial reign of Christ. It says, The sea gave up the dead who were in it. These are all unbelievers, by the way. Death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. They were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Bottom line, make sure your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. The book of life, how does that happen? By simply admitting, I'm a sinner, I cannot save myself. I, I cannot make myself holy, I cannot make myself righteous. I just need to put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone, and He can make me holy, He can make me righteous, because He paid the price that I could never pay. He shed His perfect spotless blood, the only acceptable payment for our sins and he will forgive you of all your sins he will wash you clean of all your sins past present and future and he will give you everlasting life that's what it means to be saved that's what it means to be born again he makes you a new creation in christ old things as his passed away behold all things become new this glorious promise will become yours today if you will receive Christ. Again, he who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. With Jesus, we are overcomers and we are saved forever and ever. I encourage you to read 1 Corinthians 15. It's the whole chapter on the resurrection. And then when you get to the end of that section, 1 Corinthians 56, 15, 56, Paul writes, the sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.